Nine years ago to almost this day, I was visiting my parents in East Brunswick, New Jersey. And the if you've ever been to Jersey in this time of year, everything is green. It's The humidity is just right. It's healthy. There's flowers still blooming, and it's just a beautiful day. I was standing out on the sidewalk in the front of my parents' house. There's a steps that come from the front door to the sidewalk. I was standing there. Then you go down the steps to the driveway, which is level with the uh, roadway. My father was standing in the driveway. So I was waiting for my friend Bob to come pick me up. We were going out for lunch. He and I have been friends since we were five years old, so I have lifetime friends there. And Bob pulled up in a Chrysler Sebring, you know, with the convertible, the top down, and we were going to go have some fun. So he pulled up, and he and my father, obviously Bob grew up four or five houses down, and my father had known his family the whole time. So as he pulled up, my father turned around and went, leaned over to the door and said, Hi, Bob, how are you? And he said, Mr. Kiefer, I'm doing good. How are you doing? He said, oh, fine. He said, you know something? I I've been wondering, where has your mom been? I haven't seen her in a while. Uh, Mr. Kiefer, my mom died about six or seven years ago. And when I heard that, my heart dropped. Dad, you're at the funeral. Mm. And then, ah, it's all right. He turned around, and this is something I've never seen in my life from my father. His eyes were glassy. He's like in a fog, and he's going, you could see confusion, which I've never seen from my father. And I just went, what happened? What? Oh. And it just hit me that he was, he was at the funeral. So on March 29th of this year, I flew home to Jersey again for my mom's 90th birthday party. And as I walked in the house, there's a big recliner in the house that lifts up to let the person out. It's my dad sitting in a chair. So I walked over, and I sat on the chair, and I said, hi, dad. And he puts his hand out. I said, I'm Roy. I'm your son. I'm number four. Oh, and I said, Dad, I want to tell you, I love you, and you're a wonderful father. He says, well, how would you know? I said, because I'm your son. So we had this conversation. We had, uh, my mom had a, a wonderful party, had wonderful friends, and it was a, a lovely day, and we had some people there that my father had, you could see like a blink of, he, he was, had a, his cognitive function worked for like a second or two, seeing someone from his past, which was a nice thing. My father was born October 20th, 1921. My mom was born March 29th, 1923, both in Linden, New Jersey. And at the time, the roaring uh, 20s, uh, they didn't have cars. They didn't have own a house. Uh, they didn't have gas heat, electric heat, furnaces, nothing. My father and his brother and, and my grandfather would cut wood to heat the house. My mom told me about her and her sister would lay against each other and have blankets and their body heat kept them warm at night. And to remember some of those stories, when, as I got older, I, I shopped little novelty things. I love buying things for Christmas and birthdays for my family and my friends. And I found this, like, uh, what the heck are they called? Index cards in, in a spiral bound. And they have questions, memories of mom, memories of dad. So I gave it to him, and I said, please answer these questions. Put it in writing. Even though you video everything, you still, it's, it's a different thought process when you write something down. So I, I gave it to him. Six months later, I come back and visit again. Uh, this is you know, 15 years ago or so. And, and it's one of the stories, it asks you, name your favorite birthday party. And I got the book, I read it, I went, opened it up, and I said, Mom, you didn't answer the question. She said, well, we, I never had a birthday party. Well, why? Couldn't afford it. Okay, well, how about when you went to birthday parties? We didn't go to birthday parties. Why? Because we didn't have any money for a gift. Okay, so poor then is a lot different than poor today. And, and I was learning that through my parents. So through the 30s, uh, they went to school. My father wasn't a great student. My mom was an excellent reader, a voracious reader. And she was my history teacher. Uh, I'll get to that. So uh, World War II came, and my father, not being a great student, said, you know, I want to fly. So he, he went to uh, flight school uh, for the, it's the, shoot, Army Air Corps. It wasn't the Air Force at that time, not until after World War II. So he's, he would go into the bathroom at 3 in the morning with the only light in the barracks and study. And all the straight-A students and the big macho guys that were uh, going to be paused got kicked out. My father became a second lieutenant and flew B-17s. So I'm bragging. Uh, so then my mom uh, did something that uh, she got married, and in 1944 she had my brother Bill. And she did something you don't do in the 1940s. She got divorced because of her husband at that time, hmm, a monster. So my mom and dad knew each other before they got married, before my mom married the other man. Then they got married in 1951, moved to uh, New Jersey, uh, East Brunswick, New Jersey, bought a house, a little quaint house. And then I was number four. I was born in 1958. My father built the living room, dining room, bedroom, 
a fireplace two-car garage to accommodate a growing family. And during that time, he had, uh, he became, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to back up. Uh, after World War II, he was trying to find what kind of job he wanted to do. And I, I have to put a disclaimer, I can't remember if it's an hour or per day, a nickel more to be a machinist rather than be a uh, draftsman. My father had excellent skills in doing everything perfect. And because he was patient, you know, just like me, you can tell by my personality, I'm a very patient man. And so he decided to become a machinist and he was trained by the Germans that came over post-World War I and post-World War II, because they were the best in the world. And those, he did his uh, internship with them. So during this time, he came up with an idea. And he said, I wonder if anyone's doing this yet, and he wanted to patent it. So he goes to the patent office to patent an idea he had, and he said, I'd like to find out if this exists. And the guy said, well, what is it you want to patent? He said, well, I'm not going to tell you. And he said, how am I going to let you know if it exists if you don't tell me what it is? So he goes in and he says, well, I've, I got this idea. This is about 1960. He said, I got this camera, and when you take a picture, I'd like to put the date on it automatically. So he goes in, files the patent, someone beat him to it. It wasn't out yet. So his other patent that he has is he did for us and our family. So the picture of the big house now, you don't have air conditioning, central air. You don't have... Uh, air conditioning units in it because you can't afford it. So my father cut a big hole in the eave of this attic. You have the attic stairs that drop down. And he cut the eave out, put a big fan in, and put the flaps that when the fan blows, they open up so you have air blowing out. And when, it when the fan stops, it closes so you don't let the weather come in. And picture a motor, uh, a dryer motor from a belt-driven motor. He took that, a used motor in the 1960s, and put a pulley on it, put another pulley to the fan, and put a gear on it so you have this uh, motor from the dryer used running this fan sucks the air out and brings in the cool air and you have circulating air like a swamp cooler and the and the motor is quiet you don't hear it at night and that's how he kept us cool at night all through the summer so I went up in the attic recently when I was visiting everything's still hooked up I turned it on it's still quiet that's that's my father so uh, my mom being a voracious reader was my history teacher. I learned more about history listening to her at the dinner table than I ever did when I went to school. So it was just, just seriously, um, I, I was uh, performing. I, I was a professional gymnast, and I broke a bone in my foot. I didn't know it, and it hurt a lot. And then five days later, I broke the second bone. I went, this hurts. I crawled off stage, and I went to, uh, I had to stay back at my parents' house. I had my foot propped up, and she handed me a book. Roy reading, other than quick stuff, I don't know. Kent Family Chronicles, it's, the first book's called The Bastard. It's a fict fictionalized family going through the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, into the modern day. And I read all 13 books. My mom influenced me that way in, in what history is about because she could talk about anybody, anytime, anywhere because she just read everything. So I said, Mom, tell me. To this day, at 90 years old, she can still tell you things that way. So uh, going back to my teenage years with my father is one of the one times I listened to him at dinner. And he was talking about, I don't know how the conversation started, but it's called carburetor freeze-up. That's pre, you know, fuel injection. And he said, you have fuel going through the fuel line to the, to the uh, carburetor coming from the fuel pump. And you get moisture on there when it's really, really cold outside, and the moisture forms ice, and it, it, it freezes the fuel going through the line to the carburetor, and the car just dies. And you can't figure out what it is. You think it's everything else. He said, so you never break the ice off. You put your hand on it and melt it. Car starts right up. Went, okay, yeah. Fine, Dad. So my, 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 my pot-smoking brother was partying up in Syracuse University, so I went to pick him up at, what? I went to pick him up at Christmas in a Ford LTD, and I was up in the mountains of, on the way to Syracuse, and a big blizzard hit, and my Ford LTD just died. Lights stayed on, but the engine stopped. I rolled to the side. Snow was going sideways, and I went, carburetor freeze up. I popped the hood, took the filter off. There it is. Took the glove off, melted the ice, put everything back, started the car up, went to Syracuse. So, <laughs> that, that same snowstorm, this is, sorry, I'm going another direction. Six people were in Buffalo, New York, had the same kind of problem. They died. Quite, quite impacting, quite impacting in my life from that. So uh, we, I went back another time. I, I, I travel for business, and also um, I love seeing my family. So I was always traveling, and I was in Jersey, and I went to... Uh, have dinner with my mom and dad sitting opposite ends of the table, my sister and her uh, boyfriend. What do you call a 49-year-old man dating your sister? Is it a boyfriend? <laughs> so 
we're having we're having dinner, and my dad's you know pretty much full blown Alzheimer's at this time, and my mom starts talking like this. Mom, you're having a stroke. I'm fine. Oh, by the way, my mom, uh, two open heart surgeries, carotid artery surgery, 15 heart attacks. She's still alive. All this time. So she was having a stroke, and, and she hates hospitals because of two heart attacks, carotid artery, 15 heart, all the stuff she had. And she, we can't stress her out telling her, you're going to the hospital right now. We've got one hour to, to circumvent the stroke. What's happening? And she's arguing with us. I, I know it's not going to happen. I can't go. Ma, I'm fine. Ma, curl your tongue. Can't. My, my sister's boyfriend's studying to be an EMT at that time. On the ball. My sister calls the doctor to get the heart doctor to say, Dorothy's her name. Dorothy, you need to go to the hospital. And I'm going, Mom, please. I'm texting my brother so everyone's knowing i got to ch change flights. Like, I got it. Like, it's a big thing. Um, so I'm staying to take care of my dad at the time because someone has to be with my dad 24-7. So we take her from the dining room chair and put her on a lounge chair, which is next to where my dad's sitting at the dining room table. And my da dad is a, a man of integrity, a, a man. Oh, speaking of integrity, I need to jump to a different subject about my dad. 1950s, befriends a man who lives two blocks away, John Tantillo, Italian. Loved the man my whole life, wonderful man, close, tight friends of my father, chemical engineer, intelligent, um, always call my mom, comes in, Mrs. K, how are you? How you doing? It's just, it's, she just had, he just had this infectious way with, with people. And, and a lifetime friend of my dad's. And one day I was a teenager, late eight, 19 years old, and I said, how come Mr. T never got married? I'm just curious, no kids, took care of mom. Roy is gay. Oh, okay. Not thinking of it, but think of this. My father, machinist, World War II, took a bucket lunch to work, um, very strict with us, German, had a gay friend that he loved from 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, when none of that was accepted. My father's a true man. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very proud of that. So at the dining room table, my mom sits in the chair, and uh, we're trying to get her to calm down to, with the stroke. Mom, we're going to take you to the hospital. And my father, who doesn't communicate, you don't carry on a conversation, is just sitting there. And the hands that, uh, shake, uh, that hugged and shook hands with his gay friend rubbed my feet because I had broken feet when I was a kid. The man who flew B-17s, who f can fix anything, created patents, tried to, he just took his hand, reached over, and put it on my mom's lap. It's a picture I'll never forget.